Welcome everyone. Thank you for your patience. Welcome to Table Talk for the Asian American community. My name is Andy Engel. I'm the senior programmer at Reimagine and I'm honored to welcome you all. When we created Table Talk last fall as part of Reimagine's Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Initiative, also known as JEDI, we sought to create an honest and lively an unscripted conversation where Black, Indigenous, Latinx, AAPI, LGBTQ+, and other under underrepresented groups could share their unique experiences vis-a-vis -vis living and dying well in their respective communities. Although created by and for these communities, everyone is welcome at the table. So again, thanks for joining us. Um, I want to thank the John and Wauna Harmon Foundation for their support of Reimagine and our JEDI initiative, which makes Table Talk possible. And now I want to hand this over to Holly Chan and Elizabeth Wong, our fearless captains of the AAPI Table Talk series. Uh, you guys are awesome. Take it away. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Holly Chan. I'm one of the organizers for the Asian American Pacific Islander Table Talks here at Reimagine. And I'm actually a volunteer for Reimagine. In my day-to-day -day work, I'm a user experience designer in aerospace, but I've been extremely passionate about not just uh, working on the space with AAPI folks, but before that in general, uh, making sure that end-of-life care and deaf care is more accessible financially, environmentally, and humanely to all people. So this year, we wanted to make sure to focus on AAPI folks, folks because we realized there was a need to address the specific needs for AAPI folks in this, um, uh, not, not industry, but in this subject matter. And uh, we have different thoughts about how our culture is coming to terms with grief, especially during this time. Since most of us are calling in from around the United States, Please join us in acknowledging that we are on the traditional lands of multitudes of indigenous peoples, their elders both past and present, as well as future generations. This land acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of colonialism. As a resident of Seattle myself, I'm located on Coast Salish, Duwamish, Stillaguamish, Muckleshoot, and Suquamish land. If you're curious about the ind indigenous territory where you're located, check out the link that I'm about to post in the chat or someone will post in the chat. Um, let's also remember today and hold in our heart those who have been assaulted or murdered out of ignorance and hatred. Most recently, Makia Bryant, Pat Coe, Angela Quinto, Bichar Tanapapti, Christian Hall, Breonna Taylor, Ahmad Aubrey, Elijah McLean, and really just far, far too many others. If there's someone that you would like to remember, please post her name in the chat as well. I'm gonna hand it off to Elizabeth, who is my co-creator and will be helping us today. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, while this is sort of our last table talk of this series, uh, or actually the, uh, for this series, we will have more um, programming coming up in the next coming months. So please follow um, us. Um, today, I wanna create the intention for this table talk. Um, and it's been the theme through all of our table talk events. Um, our goal is to hold space for those who identify as Asian American. When we say hold space, we found this quote from end of life doula Francesca Lynn Arnaldi to be useful to describe what we mean. We find abundant spaciousness within this space we hold. There's room for it all, joy and sorrow, laughter and tears, wonderment and worry. We invite any of it in and let it be present. Watching shifts and changes emerge. Things don't need to be a certain way. Humans are complicated beings capable of a complicated array of emotion. Francesca Lynn Arnaldi. Just like how there is no one right way to live life or grieve, there is no one right way to be an Asian American. Let's also recognize that the experiences within the Asian American community can greatly vary depending on region, color of skin, religion, immigration status, and so forth. Let's use our short time together to listen to one another's perspectives such that we can help guide ourselves, families, and our larger communities. Thank you, Elizabeth. 
So I'd like to take a moment to introduce our guests at today's table. First off is Sarah Mack. She's been a close friend of mine and she has also been an educator in China over the past few years. Most recently during the pandemic, she relocated back to the United States. And I'm so happy to have her here at the table to help me facilitate this conversation. Uh, next is Jessica Rothwell. She's a bioarchaeology PhD candidate who's been uh, exploring the anthropology of life and death throughout history and is able to also um, share what that means in her own life. Um, we also have Aisha Fukushima. She's a acclaimed performance lecturer, justice strategist, singer, songwriter, and a raptivist and founder of Raptivism. And then finally, we have Crystal Chan. She's a children's novelist, a speaker, and a social and spiritual activist. So uh, starting with Sarah and then going around the table, go ahead and give yourselves um, a larger introduction, including what table are you sitting at today, emotionally, spiritually? Um, this is Asian American Pacific Islander Month, which I know has a lot of feelings, a lot of joy, a lot of sorrow. Where are you at today, Sarah? Thanks, Holly, for that lovely introduction. Um, physically, I'm also at a table with a lot of clutter <laughs> on it, and maybe that's a good, um, yeah, I guess like a good image to also describe my life right now. Or I guess it's a, a table that's slowly getting decluttered because um, I guess for the past year or so, and I'm sure that many of you can relate in different ways, um, it seems that the general theme has been a de-stripping of things um, for me. Um, so like Holly mentioned, um, I was in China for several years teaching English, um, working with college students, and that all changed um, in the beginning of last year. And I relocated back to Washington state and um, have since moved to um, the Southwest of the US for a short-term stay. And um, yeah, I'm in a current period of wondering what is next <laughs> um, and um, finding that a lot of the things that I thought I needed to hold on to um, are actually um, impermanent. So <laughs> um, that has been uh, quite the journey. Um, but um, yeah, and I think too, just kind of figuring out um, who am I um, in this space um, as a mixed race person, as someone who is Asian American, but also as someone who, um, yeah, also has a, um, a Caucasian background and figuring out what that looks like um, in 2021 with just the amount of pain and suffering that is going on with so many, um, so many people groups on the margins. So, um, and I'm wanting to incorporate that um, and to engage more with, um, with suffering um, in my next job. So, um, that's a little bit about me. I guess it's still kind of abstract, um, <laughs> but that's where I'm at currently. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Jessica, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself next? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I am calling in today from Tempe, Arizona, which is the ancestral land of the Ookam, Pipash, and their ancestors. Um, and as a bioarchaeologist, I spend a lot of time thinking about identity, um, and mortuary practice in an archaeological context. My dissertation research actually focuses on ancient Greece, um, but I'm really excited today to kind of engage with my own uh, identities, my own experiences with grief and loss, um, and kind of take that anthropological perspective and uh, bring that to this discussion today. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited to be here uh, and part of this opportunity today. So. Thank you, Jessica. Um, and Crystal, do you want to go ahead and go next? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Crystal Chan. Uh, my Cantonese Chinese name is Mei San, so Mei San Chan. Um, I'm here in Chicago, Potawatomi area. Uh, and um, I am a children's novelist, and I use my English name for my, uh, my children's authorship, my uh, secular social justice activism, um, which I do a lot uh, social media wise, uh, especially on Facebook um, and elsewhere. Um, and then under my Chinese name, Mei San, I've been doing more and more with um, spiritual activism and spiritual companionship, most recently helping individuals kind of 
find and identify their spiritual fingerprint. Like, what does that mean? And how do you claim that? Uh, and how do you find uh, joy in that? Um, for where I'm at right now, I guess I would say just I'm in a season of claiming my fusion. Uh, and I would love to talk more about that, you know, in our conversation and, and how that's working for me and how um, I'm just like, I don't know about you all, but like 2020 and, and ongoing, obviously it's still going on so many things. I'm just done. You know, I'm just done. And I've been drawing lines and boundaries like I never have before and coming into a certain type of self-definition because of the, those lines and boundaries that I've never felt before um, and also in, in a racialized sense too. Um, so I'm really happy to kind of explore a little bit of that. And I'm also really happy to see kind of, I've, I've been kind of like going through the faces uh, of folks here in the audience. And if there's one thing that I find makes me feel really um, like claustrophobic, it's um, uh, homogeneous spaces of whatever homogeneity, whatever homogeneity. And so like to have like just the, this really diverse set of faces and names and skin tones and face, nose shapes and like all sorts of things, like it just hair, you know, just, it makes me really delighted to be here. So thank you. So glad to have you, Crystal. And last but not least, Aisha, come on up to the stage. Hey everyone, um, it's such a pleasure to be here and I just wanna say thank you again to all of the organizing that went into this and Holly, thank you for reaching out um, and just really connecting all the dots at least from my journey experience to this very moment. Um, I'm super grateful for that. My name is Aisha Fukushima, um, as you can see by the, the naming uh, on the bottom of the screen, I go by she, her pronouns mostly. And um, I'm here on occupied Lenape territory by way of what many people know as Philadelphia, but also have roots in occupied Duwamish territories. Uh, I heard a lot of Washington state love out there. So yes, to all of the things and also roots in Yokohama, Japan. And I think about people, folks like the Ainu or the Ryukyu and um, what is by many people known as Okinawa. So just wanna kind of shout out the locality um, of not only those acknowledgements, but as Holly, you put it just so clearly, you know, that this is also about how do we create decolonization and liberation <laughs> ahead. At least that's, that's part of my mission statement. <laughs> um, and I, I could hear that already resonating so much in so much of what has been said. Um, I am, I call myself a justice strategist or kind of have been dumbed, uh, dubbed that by a lot of uh, my friends um, in that I do a lot of arts and culture. I sing, I create freedom songs, I make beats and do keynotes and all of these types of things, facilitation. A lot of my skills have been honed as an educator in the classroom, both in public schools to Ivy League schools to community colleges and all of the things, they're all connected. They're all you know everywhere and in between and that's both in the United States and around the world. Um, some of my work with raptivism and starting that global hip hop justice project has been like a way of finding how to create different kinds of pedagogy and praxis that could connect dots across a lot of different places and spaces without like also questioning kind of um, uh, certain kinds of imperialized or kind of imperial and empire centric learning modes <laughs> and kind of retooling, creating um, new ways of being with one another and creating space with one another. So I say that because I think that plays into the music that I create, um, it plays into the speeches that I do and it plays into the collaboration and the, the attempt to play with the tempo of the everyday. Um, so I hope that tells you a little bit about what table <laughs> I'm sitting at. I'm super grateful to be here, and I want to make sure we have time for all the questions. But um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking. Thank you so much, Aisha. I'm so glad you could join us today. And if you tuned in earlier, that was Aisha's music that we had playing at the beginning, at the very beginning. So uh, be sure to look her up after this. Um, so to to kind of open up the conversation, we're going to start with something that simultaneously goes really deep and really broad and could potentially mean nothing at all. It depends on how you interpret it, but uh, what does home mean for you? And then we'll just go from there. So whoever wants to start can go ahead and riff off of that. You can definitely take a minute to think about it too. <laughs> 
And I, I love for the audience to also reflect on this question and share in the chat if you have any thoughts about what home means for you. I'll take a first shot at it. I usually call it a first draft thought, right? Um, home has always been a tricky place. Uh, I grew up uh, mixed race in a smallish town in Wisconsin, um, very white uh, in the 80s and 90s. And so home is that the, uh, like at the one, on the one hand, like the nature and the outdoors, like is something that's just like sunk deep in my soul. It's like left like a forever imprint, right? Indelible. Um, and on the other hand, like a place of like absolute belonging, like belonging to the earth and the sunsets and the sunrises and the sky, you know, and the birds and the hawks that fly above you. And at home, as I experienced, was, was, was like a really deep place of exclusion. Uh, on the other hand. Um, uh, and then in between like the inclusion, the exclusion, there's all of this like liminal space of like, sometimes I'm accepted and sometimes I'm not accepted. You know, so, so it's, it's, it's a very complicated uh, concept for me. And I know that um, as I've aged, uh, I've, especially in my twenties, twenties and uh, early thirties, I was really intensely looking for belonging, like on a deep belonging, because I, I felt such deep, like ambiguity about belonging at home, like even, even within the home, you know, being biracial. Um, so it's, it's always been this, this place. And, and in the last couple of years, the concept of home for me has gone on a deeper level of, um, again, like the, the sense of the elements for me have really come into play. Uh, so like, I always have the earth within me and I always have water within me and I always have air within me and like, like in that very elemental home. Um, and I think also like on a spiritual level for me, just like being really grounded in, in place and time and spirit um, uh, for me is becoming more and more important um, also, it's been interesting over the pandemic where I've been increasingly in like mixed race spaces and AAPI spaces in a way that I was never able to do in like the old world just because of physical difficulties. Um, and so like the fact that like almost every week I'm in a group of, kind of my own, you know, is like a really deep kind of satisfaction of this longing. And of course it's virtual, so it's not a total satisfaction, but like it's kind of revolutionized my world of like where home is, where home is, you know, like where is home if home is on a Zoom box, right? Like that's weird, that's weird. Um, and so it's, it's kind of like mind expanding and challenging at the same time. You know, that is interesting because I, I made this reflection only recently while I think I was texting with Liz and I don't think I shared it with you, Liz, but I haven't spent this much time in a room with other Asian American women as I have during the pandemic. And that's just during Zoom calls, you know, during these table talk events or similar events put on by our, our friends and connections. And it's crazy to think that's been missing from my life because it felt so natural. How about, uh, would anyone else like to share about where where are there moments where you found home, even if even if you don't have a definition for home, where's the moment where you felt at home in your heart? I think for me, especially as I've gotten older, home has become less of a place and more of a concept. Um, and I feel most at home when I'm with people that I feel like support me and I don't feel like I have to you know, put in extra work just to exist, just to uh, communicate with people on the same level. And so, I mean, I could identify multiple places and people as home. And I think kind of reflecting on that conceptual home rather than a physicality of place was, place can be part of that concept of home. Um, I think it really speaks to this human need to connect with other people and to be, feel heard and included and part of a community. Um, and there's so many times, especially as somebody of mixed race, feeling kind of out of place. Like you're, you're always part of one thing, but not 
all the way part of one thing and feeling that kind of tug in different directions. Um, and also for me, I'm, I'm, I'm half Filipina, half white, but for a lot of people who don't know me, I look very ambiguous. So like this also kind of societal uh, level of identity formation where people kind of make assumptions when they look at you and how they include you in their communities. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's for me, home is this kind of concept of finding your people, um, not necessarily uh, a specific place um, to go back to necessarily, but um, people you can always lean on. Yeah, I super resonate with that. Um, I when Crystal was sharing earlier about, um, you know, just like looking in the Zoom room and seeing the amount of diversity, I was like, wow, that's a space that I really feel at home in, actually. Like, I remember um, in college, like going to um, an Asian American Christian fellowship of really sweet people, like all so amazing, but feeling so out of place actually, because I was like one out of two people who were not fully Asian. And I felt like I really didn't belong there. Um, but then I also lived at like a, um, a Christian house that was predominantly white. And I also felt like just my Asian-ness was being spotlit all the time. Um, and like jokes and things like that. Um, and, but um, my, at the end of my freshman year, I started getting involved with international student groups and I had such a ball. That was like one of the most fun communities I was ever a part of. Everyone was so different and like no two people were alike in their experiences, like, or in their appear appearances. Um, and there's just this understood belief that we were always going to like be learning from each other. Um, and all of us had something to offer. Um, and I think that's been super important in like the communities that I've found home in is like, there's a sense of like deep, profound respect. And um, also of like, wanting to leave assumptions at the door, I think. Um, and yeah, I think that's like, I have individuals um, who, yeah, like I also feel super at home with um, or like families or couples that I'm like third wheeling that I really enjoy. Um, but yeah, also um, in terms of communities, I've just found that like really important. Um, and I lived in Europe for a little bit and I've lived in China and I feel like in some ways, like my heart is left behind in each place that I go to. Um, but um, yeah, there's always a little, just because like I've lived there and I've loved living there, like there still can be that displacement. But, um, but in those particular communities, like one that I did find in China and then in college, I've just really felt complete safety in um, and belonging, so yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Sarah. Wow, there's both in this conversation so far and via the chat, folks are like just dropping knowledge. So I I feel like I'm just soaking it up on all the, there's like the ones and twos and I'm just going back and forth between the the, the records, so to speak. This is incredible. Um, you know, I, I the first word that comes to mind when you ask that question about home is um, practice. The word practice came to mind. And I think, you know, Crystal, what you were saying about home is it I'll, I'll put it in my own words if is it a place of comfort is it a place of discomfort like all the things and when i look and think about my relationship for example with the united states like united states is home and i also don't always feel at home here <laughs> you know this is i and writers and you know all sorts of incredible expressive voices from james baldwin and beyond you know grace lee box could talk about you know how they both feel at home and maybe not at home so i think for me um, I think my intuitive understanding or sense of home is that it's both, it can be both. It can be both kind of uh, complex in the sense it has that comfort, it has some of that um, discomfort or lack of belonging. It also has some challenge. Someone wrote in the chat um, that home is in their body. And I was also thinking about how sometimes people can feel at home in their body and also not feel at home in their body. 
um, pending all the things that are going on, you know? And so I, and then I started to think about this word practice too, right? Like what is a practice, why does practice come to mind when I think of home and I think about even my vocal practice that makes me feel at home in my body, but there's challenge there. It's pushing me out of my comfort zone. It's training me to see how I can play with my breath to make different sounds and feel supported or make something sound not supported, you know, just have dynamics. And I feel like that's a good metaphor to sort of how I often feel that I'm moving through the world. and. When I think about feeling, quote unquote, at home, I think about a lot of places that held that kind of complexity, whether that's through the metaphor of singing or what I was describing before with kind of the national identities or however you want to, you know, lingua you want to use to define that. I think about classrooms. I think about uh, theater rehearsals. I think about band practice. I think about, you know, all these different kinds of, you can call them rituals, practices coming together. We're like, we're here and we know not every school day that I taught was smooth or easy <laughs> for everyone in the room or anyone in the room sometimes, you know, and that was like, but we were there. We showed up. We showed up. And so I think um, to me, so, uh, some of all of that is part of what home is. Um, one last thing that pops into my mind on this this question is I remember um, as when I was growing up as a young person, especially kind of the very early age, my parents, um, we would kind of go back and forth between Yokohama, Japan and uh, Seattle, Washington. And every time I would get to, and, and kind of everywhere in between because they were working in the music industry at that time. And so I remember that every time I would get to an airport, I'd be like, I'm home. <laughs> It's like this place of transition. I'm like, yes, this is my spot. I saw someone else in an airport uh, via the chat, so resonating with that. Um, but if that is that's any clue into kind of what feels like home for me, yeah. Amazing, thank you. And I, I never really thought of the idea that a liminal space like an airport could actually feel so at home, but I. I definitely have felt moments of that when I've gone for airports, not all the time, especially non-security, but when, I don't know, I, I laid in Hong Kong for the first time and then all I have to do is just like scan my ID card and go right through. Hong Kong is definitely like not a totally familiar place to me, but it is a place where I can finally feel like, oh yes, my people or like my my weird Hong Konger people that aren't quite Chinese, not, not quite anything else. Um, well, we've kind of brushed upon this, but I love to know if any of you have any stories about times where you felt either joy or sorrow with your identity, whatever that might be. Uh, not to be glib, but I would say like always, yes. <laughs> always, yes. Um, it's always, I, I've been learning better how to hold the tension and how to also recognize that the tension doesn't come from me. The tension comes from the world around me telling me I need to fit in a box. And so like putting, putting, that responsibility and putting like the, the source of that attention where it really belongs, which is not like I, nothing wrong with me, right? Um, and so, uh, but still, it's, it's so so it's still kind of like claiming my intrinsic worth and value and legitimacy. That's always a big thing. Um, legitimacy, uh, uh, and, but also realizing that this is really because of our racialized conditioning of like what boxes we're supposed to fit into. Um, and, and I've found that the, you know, being mixed, growing up in Wisconsin in the eighties and nineties, like it's really taught me that I, I, I didn't have the resources that I needed uh, to fully navigate my world. Um, uh, I did not get any racial identity formation from either of my parents, you know, that kind of a thing. I didn't even hear of the word biracial until I was studying in France when I was 20. That was the first time when I saw someone who physically looked like me. Um, and so it's just like the, the realization that like the world doesn't have what I need. It, do, it will not give me the tools that I need. Even if it had, 
they don't exist yet, you know? And so like, I need to make the tools because they don't exist. Like I, I can't expect uh, my elders to give them to me because they don't have them either. Um, you know, and so there's, there's a certain type of a loneliness. I'm just like, oh, I have to keep building this stuff. You know, like some of like my, my novels feature mixed race protagonists because I didn't have mixed race anything growing up. Like I didn't have a book, one book, you know, of a mixed race person any, anywhere. Um, you know, and they're, they're always like, well, write the book you want to read as a child if you're writing for children. And it's like, well, clearly um, I have to write it because it doesn't exist. Um, you know, and, uh, and so there, there's just all of that, like the, the joys and the sorrows. And yet at the same time, because of that, it's really propelled me into being a creative, you know, and, and creating spaces, creating virtual spaces, creating books, creating spoken word meditations, creating this, creating that. And it's like, uh, you know, so not waiting and I'm not waiting anymore for that somebody to give me legitimacy because in this racialized world, no one's going to give me legitimacy. Right. I don't fit into a box. Right. And so so it's kind of like, where does that legitimacy have to come from in order for me to stand in any sort of like intrinsic power? And that's like I, it has to come from within. So and yet it's so sad because it's like, dang, this takes energy. You know, um, this is a this it can be really lonely uh, and, and hard and, and intensely rewarding as well. Um, so so, yeah, it's like always all the time. Yes. No. Yes. Crystal, everything that you said resonated with me on so many levels. Um, I think not only in a racialized sense, but in the sense that I'm the first person in my family to pursue a PhD. Um, and this kind of feeling of joy and, but also kind of somewhat not belonging within an academic space. Um, academia, while increasingly diverse, is still very white. They don't call it an ivory tower for no reason. Um, and there's a lot of times, especially when you get to the level of PhD where like, there's just this unspoken kind of language that you're expected to know, this unspoken knowledge of how you're supposed to navigate the academic space, that if you don't find the right mentors, that if you don't find the right support network, then you're just, you, you've got to create that space for yourself. Like there's, there's simple things that seem simple to me now that I am a, you know, I'm an educator. Um, I TA a lot of undergrad courses and I always tell them like, talk to your mentors, even if you feel like you're being successful in the class. I didn't know that when I was an undergrad. I had to learn that later by blindly following what other students were doing. And nobody gives you a handbook on how to navigate academia or navigate life, especially when you're feeling like you're in this space of in-betweenness. And, you know, in navigating that space, I've, I've been grateful to find community with other students who are kind of in the same space, who are first generation graduate students who come from backgrounds where maybe even their parents didn't go to college or like, you know, you're told when you're younger, just do good in school and things will fall where they may, um, which is kind of the experience I had and like trying to navigate that space um, has been, it's, it's been complicated and it's complicated on an extra level by being in a space where I mean, there's there's other there's other people in my department who are people of color or mixed race, but like they don't look like me necessarily. They don't have the same backgrounds, and we can relate on so many different levels. But it's it, it's hard to find that space, like spaces like this, where you can find people who can kind of relate with you and help you build um, that space to be in, because the the world outside isn't going to build it for you, like Crystal said. I'm losing track of the question, but that's good because I want to just riff with it. It, it kind of it kind of just evolves over time. Yes, like, it's I like a game of telephone. <laughs> I wanted to be transparent on that point because this is we're journeying here. So, um, yeah, you know, I think part of what came to heart and mind is um, in the beginning of the conversation, a lot of folks or it was brought up like being in more spaces like this one, and especially with focus on what. I don't want to say API a because the PI is often <laughs> not always as included as I think it could and should be. Um, 
But I think for me, it's kind of rare for me to be in spaces like this without volunteering myself or saying, hey, I'm, I should be included too. <laughs> um, and so I think that's something that I hold in the balance um, amidst I kind of agreeing and resonating with all of the, what's been said that often um, I feel in this moment both uh, fully seen, like hyper, <laughs> uh, you know, perceived on a national scale, whether that's by way of the Naomi Osaka kind of version or the, you know, I can go down a whole list. Some people might count Kamala Harris, some might not. You know, it's like there are all these different kinds of that, that kind of lifts up a lot of assumptions that we might have. Um, I think for me also the thinking about the history of the one drop rule in the United States and how that plays into who gets called, who doesn't, and how, you know, how the politics, I, I don't even use the term to be quite honest, uh, mixed race, because I fear that a lot of times when people use the term race, and including especially towards me, I've heard all sorts of things. People say, oh, you're a mutt, things like that, you know, where it's like, that's part of the tapestry of my experience. And that's based, I, my humble studies <laughs> I would say that that's based in an essentialized kind of way of looking at race that, that you might say that you, one might say that they think it's constructed but then all the things that follow don't necessarily illustrate or maybe there's some cognitive dissonance in how we hold and move with those words and so I, I just name that because I think that plays such a huge role and I'm seeing how clearly um, that that plays into some of the politics of today at least through my humble lens and also how I feel both super seen and unseen uh, during times like these, if that makes sense. Um, super present, all of a sudden I'm getting all these calls that I'd never received before <laughs> from all these different groups and then you know, also um, not seen or not to be included. And I think that's kind of part of, I think, Crystal, I feel like you said part of this and it's kind of just been throughout the conversation is also carving out that practice of home, that practice of liberation. Um, one that is not only cognitive, but one that is embodied too. And so for me, the freedom songs and even the facilitation techniques are really, uh, to me, part of, I think I, uh, Fred Hampton said a quote of something like, just as we don't fight fire with water, or we fight fire with fire, we fight fire with water. Um, and we don't fight racism with more racism, we fight racism with solidarity. And so I'm thinking about ways of building solidarity in critical ways, hopefully that can also shift political systems, uh, policy, you know, socioeconomic economic pieces <laughs> that are part and parcel to the inequalities that um, I think are part of some of my lived experience and I think a lot of America and, and the whole, you know, globe, around the globe when we look at inequality, um, ranging from vaccines to money to all the other things that are connected. Yeah, I could keep going, but I'll pause there, excuse me. <laughs> Oh, well, we'll keep going with that. <laughs> Thank you. Sarah, I saw that you were about to say something earlier. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, actually, it's good because I got to hear what Aisha had to say. And I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so good. <laughs> and it actually like helped me think a little more about, yeah, I think like my answer just kind of, yeah, hearing how the convo is flowing. And I love that Aisha that you said like, it's about like lifting each other up and a lot more about solidarity because I think growing up, um, I was just constantly comparing myself. And I think, um, you know, when you grow up mixed race and I think particularly being part Asian, um, there's a sense of like not enoughness or you didn't like, no matter what you do, you're never gonna be enough to fully qualify. Um, so like, I didn't grow up speaking Cantonese at home. I didn't grow up speaking Vietnamese at home. Like my dad grew up in Vietnam and like, I was always left out of those conversations at home when everyone is like talking in Canto and you know, they're talking about you cause they'll like say your name and then they'll just like keep talking. And then you're like, okay, so probably something was said about me and I have no idea what it is. Um, and I'm just sitting here like, watching Pokemon with my brother and we both can't understand. Um, but um, yeah, and I, like, I think even recently, like a couple years ago, I met a girl who had almost the same experience, but not quite the same experience as me. But we were like, finally, I was like, oh, I've met someone that like almost aligns with my story. Like, and it's been so long since 
I've met anyone like that. Um, but then I noticed like she was like learning. I think I, I felt like, oh, she knows more about the food than I do and how that was like hard for me to accept like, um, oh no, like I, I've like failed. Um, and I felt so sad about it. Like, oh no, I'm like not doing a good enough job. And I, I just really want to reject that, um, that mindset that, um, I think like Crystal said, it is like, it has to come from within and it, it can be, I think such a lonely road to travel when you're like, my story is like so different from others and it kind of like alienates me from my family like even the people who are supposed to be the closest to me or like from my friends who are this that or the other thing um but like also um I think it is like such a powerful tool to um yeah be like yes this is lonely um but also I think I can like still see my worth and still see my value and like call that out in other people when they feel the same way. Um, yeah. And so, um, I don't know. I think that, I don't know if that like totally is an excellent response to like the conversation that has been going on, but that just like struck me as like, I think that there's just been such an, it's so easy to like box yourself or to like cut you off from other people. Um, but actually I think that that's not the call that we need right now. Um, so I don't know, just something that I was thinking about. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Jess. Everything you just said, Sarah, I just connected with on a really deep level. I also, I don't speak Tagalog and I didn't learn until I was an adult that the reason why my mom stopped teaching me is because my dad had told her to not teach me Tagalog because he wouldn't be able to understand us. And now it just, I mean, it's been, and you know, I'll go, I'll hang out with my family. All of my cousins speak Tagalog. All of them have both Filipino parents. Um, and like, I'll go to family gatherings and they'll all be speaking with each other. And it's, it's hard. It's hard because they'll have to like switch to English to speak to me. And you know, when you're older, it's hard to learn a new language. It's hard to carve out that time. And it's something I've wanted to do, but you know, life kind of pulls you in different directions of that kind of feeling of, kind of feeling apart. Um, even though you know you're still, you're still a part of that family, but feeling that kind of loss of connection with that, uh, that with your kind of ancestry. Um, and I think, I think specifically for me, especially when I think about the colonial history of the Philippines and um, kind of what that means in terms of this loss of identity over time um, or this kind of reforging of new identities over time. And it's, it's, it's painful to think about, honestly. Um, and like, I, I, I know like, I mean, I, my family still loves me for what I am, but I've always felt kind of apart um, in that way. And it's it's something I've struggled with for a really long time. Um, and kind of, uh, you know, thinking about that manifestation of a kind of colonial I ideas within kind of my own life experience. Um, I also uh, resonated with Aisha was saying about this this kind of idea of racial essentialism and like the, the problems with it. And as an anthropologist, that's something that I grapple with every day. That's something that as an anthropologist and as any anthropologist is ethically responsible for. Uh, acknowledging the history of anthropology and how it uh, contributed to um, concepts of race in the United States and abroad um, and dismantling that. Um, through uh, acknowledgement and kind of disentangling it and standing up for um, people who have been hurt by that. Um, and uh, the American Association for Physical Anthropologists has put out multiple statements on race to address this, but you know, it's still something that we have to talk about every day. It's race is not a biological cons construct, it is a social construct, but that does not mean that it doesn't have a biological impact on people. There are people who because of their race, because of their identity, because of this kind of social 
uh, construct around them. They've, they've experienced grief, they've experienced loss, they've experienced inequality that directly impacts their health. Um, and I don't know, as, as, as somebody with my background, with my life experiences, it's something that I'm constantly kind of nagging at the back of my mind, something that I'm constantly thinking about. Um, and it's something I feel really responsible for sitting in this academic space. Like I have a responsibility to do better than people did before me. Um, and yeah, it's, I'm sorry, I'm like going on this like weird tangent, but. Um, Actually, uh, yeah. Jessica, are you, are you comfortable with talking about, because I think we alluded to this before, but how has your time in academia and studying anthropology, anthropology um, helped you reflect on your own personal life experiences, especially with grief? Yeah. Um, so for me, I think one of the, when, when I was growing up, I didn't really think about my, I, I, I thought about my identity, but not on, on such a deep level that I do now that I have these kind of, uh, these theoretical tools that I can use to kind of think about identity formation and think about my own positionality within the world. Because a, a lot of the, the, the kind of positive aspects of anthropology, it's about thinking about your positionality as a researcher um, and how that relates to um, kind of the, the social constructs that you're, you're studying. Um, and it's, 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 grad school has been complicated. Um, my mom passed away uh, my first semester of graduate school um, she was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer during my junior year of college, I believe. Um, and it's, she was always the kind of person who's like, you do good in school. I'm not going to distract you from that. Like literally when she was diagnosed, she didn't tell me for like three months. I had gone to school. I came home for Thanksgiving, expected her to pick me up from the airport. My two aunties came to pick me up. And when I got home, I saw her sitting there with an oxygen machine. Uh, and I was so, like, I didn't know how to react. I was mad, I was upset. Um, and, you know, and when I went to, when I started graduate school, like thankfully she was able to come to my college graduation. We had time together. Um, but when I went to graduate school, like she didn't really wanna tell me um, what was going on back home. Um, I, I went to one radiation treatment with her before I, I packed up and left for Arizona. And then, um, you know, my mom's like, oh, how are you doing in school? I don't want to distract you. Like we'd call every once in a while, but she'd never want to tell me how she was doing because she just wanted me to do good in school. I'm like, mom, there are things that are more important than like school. And like any good educator, any good college professor, if you have a parent that's dying, they're going to let you leave class. And if you have a professor that doesn't let you do that, then that's a problem, that's their problem, that's not yours. Um, and anyway, like even when she was in the hospital right before she died, my aunties and uncles didn't wanna tell me what was going on because she told them that she didn't wanna distract me from school. Um, and it wasn't until my uncle had sent me a text message being like, hey, you should get a flight home this weekend. Like, and it was like the middle of the week and I didn't know how to react. I didn't know what was going on. Nobody would tell me what was going on. And I understand like culture, they didn't want to talk about. My mom had told them not to talk to me about it. They wanted to respect their wishes. I don't blame them for that um, at all. I understand. Um, but it, my roommate at the time uh, was with me. She was in her office and I just like ran over there and she called the hospital and figured out what was going on. And like I talked to my advisor and they're like, go, go, go. Like you can be gone for two weeks. We'll like figure out your schedule, whatever. Um, and it was just kind of this clash of mentalities. Like the, my, like there was this idea of like, oh, the school is the most important thing you're doing right now. And where's my advisor? And like, uh, you know, the graduate advisor were like, no, go, we'll figure it out later. Do what you need to do. And I am so glad I was able to be there. Like I was able to hold her hand right till the end. Um, but it was, it felt so surreal. It felt so surreal as like in my research, I, I look at death and dying all the time. I look at mortuary practices. I, um, but like experiencing it, it was the first time I'd seen, so I'd been there for someone who died. It was the first time I'd attended a funeral. And like, I felt like more like a participant observer than anything. So both the participant in that it was my mom and like I was there grieving for her. Um, 
but also just kind of the, the, the practice around it was very alien to me. Um, a lot of my mom's side of the family is very religious. I grew up Catholic. I don't go to church anymore for various reasons, but for them, it's like very important culture. That's how they raise as part of their connection to the Philippines. Um, and so like I was sitting there and like everybody's praying the rosary and I'm like trying to process my own grief. Um, and looking back on it now, it, it and like, you know, I, I look at kind of grief and mourning in the art in the archaeological context too, and thinking about this kind of contrast between this social mourning so like the the process of the funeral all of the, the the kind of ritual around it that people use to process that grief and then the personal grief um and it's yeah and that that kind of personal grief gets torn between like your own identity and your own kind of concepts of how to process it and kind of the cultural norms that you are surrounded by it's like my my mom said like everyone that was at the funeral it's like they knew what they were doing um, my, my, I mean, they, they experienced my grandparents died before I was, before I was born. Um, and so like, it's like, they all knew what they're doing. They'd seen this before they were going through the motions and like, obviously everybody was grieving in their own way. But for me, it was this surreal kind of out of body experience. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a, for, for me, it was a very kind of like complicated relationship between my, my own identity and like my, my mom's side of the family, they all immigrated from the Philippines in the late seventies. Um, whereas me and my cousins, we all grew up in the United States our entire lives. Um, and so it's kind of this tension between my experience growing up in America, my experience with, you know, my kind of tangential experience with death, but not actually experiencing it firsthand. Um, and then navigating those cultural norms and being respectful of what my family needed to process that grief um, and kind of figuring out what I needed at the same time. Um, so yeah, it was, it was just a, it's kind of navigating those identities and dealing with grief has been, it's been, it's been, it's been uh, complicated, I guess. Um, and it, it was, it was interesting at the same time. So like on the kind of the religious aspect, my mom, she didn't want a funeral mass. She just wanted a blessing at the grave. But I remember at the funeral, like people being like, oh, I contacted the priest and they're gonna dedicate such and such mass to your mom. And I'm like, okay, like if, if that's part of what you need to mourn her, that's that's good. And it was kind of this weird uh, tension. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's this kind of intersection of identities making it even more complicated um but yeah I don't know I don't really know what else to say on that but gosh thank you for sharing Jessica yeah yeah just hearts all around especially from the chat for you and like we, we actually um I so I actually also know Jessica growing up in our childhood um so I I do remember seeing her and her mom at our church growing up, and I, I think we fell out of contact during the time that your mom was in the hospital, so I didn't know until I saw it on Facebook, and it was also just weird coming home and not seeing her when I was visiting with my folks at church. Thank you for sharing that. Well, uh, this Part of what reimagine does actually like the core of what reimagine does is um, create these spaces so that we can talk about grief so that we can talk about things that make us like really reflect on ways that we have grieved throughout our lives and um, did, did anyone else have any stories from their own lives about grief that they've experienced and how their identities may have factored into it, may have not factored into it at all, but just how everyone grieves throughout their lives. Like it, it's affected by our entire life story. If, an, if anyone has anything to share, then this is a perfect space for it because we're all here together in this room. And I'm reading through the chat. Thank you all for sharing your stories and your support.
Uh, so, Crystal, Aisha, or Sarah, do you have anything to add? Otherwise, I can bring in a question from the audience that we've had. I'd love to share um, a little bit about how uh, I'm, I'm reflecting on, on my experience with grief. Uh, it actually through like there's tons of parallels between the grief, this my my grief process, and then also how I've experienced a lot of the hardships of the about being mixed race itself. Um, it was kind of illuminating for me. Um, so when I was 11, I basically, in a nutshell, I got a death diagnosis from a group of um, uh, neurosurgeons and neurologists in Madison. Uh, they were doing like a follow-up CAT scan after a brain surgery and found this mass um, in uh, a very deep part of my brain. Uh, and they basically pulled my parents into the doctor's room and I was outside in the, in the lobby and, uh, and for like hours. And, and I knew something was up. And uh, basically they, they, they described the situation in that like, it was in, in such a deep part of my brain that if they were to operate, they would kill me. Uh, and if they were to uh, do chemotherapy, I would basically um, just not be functional for the rest of my life. Um, and, uh, and so which one do you want? Which option they were saying to my parents. Um, and, and at that point, uh, and then they said, and they said, and you must make a decision. My parents were like, well, we, we just want to have her live as best of a life as she can. And they said, no, you, you, you need to make a decision. This was in the eighties. So medical ethics too, in the eighties. Um, and, uh, and then they said, but it just so happens that tomorrow a world renowned neurosurgeon just so happens to be stopping in. And because he is so amazing, we will, he can look at everything and he can, uh, he will have the final say if you're, if you're interested. And we're like, of course we're interested, right? So, um, so at that point, my parents uh, booked a hotel room and I was still confused. And it was there in the hotel room that my parents basically told me I was going to die. Um, there was this small chance about this doctor coming the next day. And, um, and uh, I wrote my goodbye letter to my best friend at the time. Um, and we had the worst, we went out for Red Lobster and we were, we, we had very modest means. And so like, that was like the big splurge it's ever like, and it was the worst Red Lobster dinner you could ever possibly, like it tasted just so terrible, right? And, um, and the next day the doctor came back and said, uh, when, when we met with him, he said, you know, look, there is something there. We know it. Um, however, uh, let's just wait and, and just monitor uh, the status because we're going to kill this child one way or another if we do anything. Um, and he saved my life. Uh, and so, but all throughout, like I had to have CAT scans and MRIs, like first it was weekly and then bi-weekly and then monthly and then bi-monthly and then quarterly. And then, you know, just like for 10 years. So I have so much radiation in me, like I can't even tell you. Um, but it was just like, I, at any moment, he said, we need to proceed with like, cause they, the doctors wanted to do chemo like the, the very next day, right? And so like, but this, this specialist, he said like, let's, so I've always had my, my mortality has always been in front of me, always. Um, and, and so when I was in fifth grade, of course, you know, like the girls are thinking about like who they have crushes on. And I'm thinking about like, oh, I have my, my, my scan tomorrow. I hope I'm going to live, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and that followed me for 10 years, when they stopped finally um, monitoring, but it still proceeds even just today. I mean, like if anything happens, you know, and, you know, the list of like the warning triggers of, you know, of symptoms um, and everything could be over, like game over, right? Um, and I found out much later that in this, in, in a neighboring town, the same thing happened in the same time frame where a girl, there was, there was a brain tumor and the doctors wanted to operate and the parents said no. And, um, and this was like within six months of, of what happened to me uh, in a neighboring town. And the doctors took the parents to court for negligence because the parents did not want to do anything. And the doctors won. They proceeded with, the with, with their thing and, and they killed the girl. So that was the era 
right? That was the era of medical ethics and everything. And so like I squeaked, like there was just like this thin line of survival for, I'm just like, wow. Um, and so, but even now I know like, and actually that's fueled a lot of my activism is, uh, is like, dude, like life could end tomorrow, dude. You know, like, do you understand that? Like, I don't want to watch movies. I don't, I want to do stuff. I want to do stuff, you know, like there is, there's no time to waste. So definitely some survivor's guilt in some of this, right? Um, but also, um, I think as I've been reflecting on it, I think like this, this type of liminal health status, right? Um, also mirrors a lot of like my journey with being mixed race itself. Um, so like, first of all, like being in a liminal space, right? Am I healthy? Am I almost dead? You know, like like could, could the switch could happen. What am, what am I actually uh, health wise? And of course, the what am I racially? Um, so that's one thing. Um, another thing is precariousness. You know, obviously, like with with this quasi death sentence, you could be dead at any time, at any at any one scan, like game over. But there's so much precariousness in being mixed race for me, in terms of belonging. In any moment, in any group, they could kick me out because I'm not, as Jessica was saying, I'm not enough, right? So there's this precarious sense of like trying to earn the belonging. Well, they, the, the giving of belonging, the withholding of belonging, you know, like you're not, you're, you're not enough. You're not, your skin isn't dark enough. Your nose isn't, you know, whatever it is, your hair is too curly, la, 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 la. You know, so there's this precariousness of belonging. And then there's also like this, unshared inner reality you know when I was a kid you know so growing up like I had my mortality always in front of me and like they didn't understand what it was there was this unshared inner reality of what was going on inside as I'm walking through I'm, you know I'm still like you know the girl la, 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 in class but you know inside there's this awareness of like I'm different number one and obviously being mixed you know existentially biologically I am biologically I don't share your reality externally, but also this internal, um, like an unshared inner reality of isolation, of genetic isolation, especially I'm speaking as a biracial, you know, so like monoracial, monoracial, biracial, like genetic isolation, and also not having a language to speak. Because again, like this field is so new, but it's like sometimes like when you grieve, you don't have the words, right? You, you, you fumble around and you're like, I, I can't even explain what I'm feeling. Same thing for me with being mixed. Like there's a lack of language around being mixed. Like, what is it when I'm, when I'm light skin and do I belong, do I not? What is the word? There's no word right now. You know, I, I'm highlighted. There is a lack of a word and then they have like uh, white adjacent and that's not a good word. Like we, we, we're fumbling around for these words uh, and we don't have the words. And I feel like that same thing with, um, with that, and then also finally, like this concept of silencing, um, you know, as Jessica was saying, like, like we don't talk about, don't talk about it, don't talk about it, you know, for for grieving. But it's the same thing with being mixed. Don't talk about your feelings about being. Don't talk about. I don't want to know your questions. Like, there's there's this sense of like these questions, the like this inner reality doesn't belong anywhere in this in this world of boxes. And so like we silence ourselves or our parents silence us or our loved ones or our friends silence us. And so, um, uh, you know, and, and so I think like, there's just this, this topic of grieving. I think maybe it, there's almost like this inherent, like we must like this, as Jessica was speaking, I had this aha moment of like grief, like as mixed race people, we really like in part of our healing, I think as part of our, like we need to claim the fact that we need to grieve the fact you know, it's just the, the different types of losses, the different types of erasings, the different type, even within from our own parents and from within ourselves and within everything. Like there's so much grieving just in being mixed. Um, and of course, I'll, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different ways that all different types of groups uh, also need to do grieving for their own health. But, but I think also like, like the, the type of grieving for the mixed race healing of just mixed race grieving is just like, there's a lot of nuanced losses that I think get glossed over in, in like the big tsunamis of news headlines and everything. And, and I think that could very well be a, an important part of at least my healing is really like owning the grief 
um, because there's a lot of great stuff in being mixed and not, you know, no joke, but, but to be true to myself, I need to really honor the fact that there's, there's a lot of deep losses as well. So it's just really interesting that like my having my, my medical history and like my, my mixed race, uh, uh, journey are actually very parallel to each other. And I just kind of wanted to voice that if anybody. Thank you for that helpful. Gosh. <laughs> yeah, that. That's a pretty incredible that you had to write a farewell letter when you were 11. But that, yeah, that's a ton of weight to grow up with and to deal with from a young age. But thank you so much for sharing that and how that's that's kind of led to your active that has led to your activism and the amazing personality that we have here today. Um, Aisha or Sarah, do you want to share any stories about it doesn't have to be necessarily a loss that you had in your life, but how has grief appeared in your life and how have you come to terms with um, addressing it or living with it? Yeah, would be to jump in um, or open to jumping in. Maybe that's a yeah. <laughs> uh, more fun term. I think Gosh, I would, I, there are so many layers to this. Um, I'm trying to th think about how to kind of uh, bring it together. But I think one part, um, when I was preparing for this conversation or just kind of meditating on this conversation to come, I was thinking about the passing of my grandmother long ago, um, or relatively more than a decade ago, uh, when I was still kind of in secondary school. And she was a very important figure, not only for me, but for my family, kind of this, you know, the glue that keeps things, everything together and keeps peace and also, uh, you know, encourages open mindedness. Like I think about so many of the way things that she passed on to us, like my mother is African American and she speaks Mandarin and she spent a lot of her summers in Taiwan, even though our family had, was working class and like had all these, you know, all these layers that my grandma, part of the, the abundance of her spirit, um, sowed those seeds and probably were passed on from folks that I don't know or histories that have been uh, erased or hidden. Um, and so on one level, I think it's both difficult and uh, really powerful to think about how our histories can play a role in how we understand transition and death and dying and living fully, <laughs> however we might <laughs> mean that. Um, and I, I think a lot about my mom is also like super open to talk about transition, to talk about death and, you know, has, I grew up in a Buddhist household as well, in addition to all the other faiths that are in my family. So very much, you know, talking about transition through that, the Buddhist philosophy, which I'm not going to even try to summarize <laughs> here, but um, I think in some ways she kind of forced me to have conversation and still today forces me to have conversations about this on a regular basis in a way that I think has been really powerful for me to also think about death and dying as a, that there are many different kinds of transitions. Perhaps for some, a new year is, the, the old year is passing. There's a, you know, there's a, a renewal, there's a burning of incense or other things that maybe arise in, for example, some uh, Japanese funereal traditions. Um, in African-American traditions, although I don't wanna try to summarize any of these things, <laughs> but you know, you think about home going um, and it kind of, for me, it makes me very sad to also think about that feeling of being liberated finally from all the, <laughs> the weight of the histories, if you will. Um, and so I, I think a lot about, I try to bring the concept of transition and death into kind of daily life and to help destigmatize it, to help unpack it by thinking about the ways in which um, it's also a transformation. And I like to think about that kind of like no energy is created or destroyed, it only just transforms. And so I think about that in terms of my loved ones who have passed, whether that's my grandmother's uh, spirit and energy, or I think about that in terms of even the art that it forces you to kind of re rework things. I like, I've been thinking a lot about during this pandemic garden metaphors, although I'm not, I could use some gardening lessons, so anyone out there, <laughs> but, but I think a lot about how you know, I had a house plant that was slowly just like not, it was not doing well, right? And I talked to a, a friend who was really great with house plants and they said, well, how's the soil? And it's very hard. They're like, you gotta poke some holes into it. Otherwise it can't absorb the nutrients. It can't absorb the water. And sometimes it feels like the 
the tension around that conversation can prevent us from holding the nutrients, holding some of the waters, holding some of the nourishment, and also allowing things to flow through that are no longer serving us. So I think about things like that. I think about composting, like the power of composting, all the, the you know, someone alluded to the cortisol levels, how the, the, the uh, racialized impacts of our lived experience, you know, how that can flow through. My grandma would always say, hate poisons the soul. So how can I compost some of that, that everyday feeling? I also think about the context of passing and dying in different, like whether it's um, by age or chronic illnesses or the list can go on and on and or by police brutality or all these, you know, <laughs> different formations um, that I have that's all part of the kind of knitting stuff that I'm, I'm working through. And I try to think about those garden metaphors, think about creativity as a force to uh, become, to gain proximity and some sort of fluency um, in, in being able to talk about it and being able to connect. Um, and hopefully without the same kind of fear that sometimes shuts us off from one another. Yeah, I'll pause there. Thank you so much, Aisha. So uh, it's actually the time where we'd like to take audience questions. And I'm gonna start with the ones that have been in the chat, especially the ones that people have been adding on to. Um, but I'm gonna direct this first one to Sarah because I know she has a brother. Um, if any of you have siblings, have you had conversations about these topics or themes? And uh, if, if you have or haven't just why or why not and how did it go yeah Sarah how'd it go yeah um they're pretty short <laughs> most of the time um my brother and I are fairly opposite um I would I think he would not be offended if I said that um we're we just think very differently um and like the one thing that I can use to describe, like, I guess how a lot of people would see me is like in Mandarin, we'd say like, like you think way too much about it. And I feel like that's his attitude when I talk, when I think about identity and being mixed. He's like, you you think way too much about this. Like I'm over here doing my thing and you're over here doing yours. Um, and so I find like talking explicitly about being mixed is like just not helpful. Like even, but actually like connecting and like naming specific experiences we have had and like not attaching like, I guess like very analytical language to it actually produces more fruit in the conversation. Um, yeah, like it's kind of funny, I guess like, I guess it's like, I can't expect, you know, like someone can't expect me to like know perfect Cantonese, right? Like I didn't grow up with it. Like we didn't grow up with like this language of like knowing what it is to like be mixed. Like, I think we're the only people in like either side of my family who is. Um, and um, I only like really started to delve into my identity and what that meant for me, like in college. And of course it's gonna be a super different experience than his. We went to different schools, we have different personalities. Um, and in the end, like, I don't think it really matters if he knows the specific term or not or like if he if he can like names like these really you know like the same exact feelings that I can but I think we both can relate to like it's uncomfortable <laughs> like it's it can be so uncomfortable to be in like a family space and um to like be struggling with like chopsticks when you're like way too old, you know, to like, um, to like, you know, be just starting to learn or like to, um, you know, like attend either side of a family reunion and feel like we have so many different thoughts and feelings than what our families think or feel and how they interact. Um, so yeah, I guess that's what I would say about my brother. Um, yeah, I, I actually like asked him some questions for this panel and he didn't have a lot to say actually, um, but he was supportive um, and I think that's, that's cool. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, didn't mean to put you on the spot with there, but you're the one person that I know has a sibling. So. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Did anyone else on the panel want to answer that question as well? 
Like, have you had an opportunity to talk to family members or siblings, especially about the experiences of being multiracial? I would just like to name too, I think talking to parents is a completely different ballgame than talking to siblings. Yeah. Um, yeah, like my, like if, if we wanted to talk about parents and, you know, whether or not they even acknowledge, <laughs> you know, um, you know, your mixed identity, I think that's a whole nother can of worms. Um, For sure. Well, um, Liz actually has been compiling all the questions that have been asked in the chat. Liz, you want to go ahead and pose yeah. one of the questions? Thank you so much, everyone, for um, putting your questions um, in the chat. Um, I will just start with how the order that it came in. Um, there is a question about um, geographically, do you feel a person of the world or feel geographically in one place? I think that's for um, all the speakers. And it seems like maybe some of you have already addressed it, but if there's anything that you would wanna add um, in particular. And as you think about that, I am also um, able to move on to the next question. Um, how do you hold all the ancestors in your lineage? These are some very thoughtful questions. It's <laughs> feel, feel welcome to think out loud. I yeah. hold them. This is how I hold my ancestors. I hold them like, like this, like this. <laughs> you know, All of them. Your embodied <laughs> answer. That's my embodied answer. Awesome. Um, you know, I've. It's been really interesting with ancestors and ancestry because obviously that's such a huge thing right now. Uh, it's always been big, but our eyes have not always been open to know that. Um, my, my Chinese dad withheld basically all of his ancestry. Uh, he's one of the types of immigrants where like you start over and you erase everything. Um, my mom's side was my, my, my white side. My, my grandmother got Alzheimer's and my, my grand, like, like very little on either side, very little on either side. And in some ways it just felt so, uh, dislocating like where where am I even located you know and I think that's one of the reasons why I find so much home in like earth right and earth practices but ancestors it was it was really so like I've always been like what what do I do with this like I don't even know my answers what what, what is this and um I was in a in fact I one of one of Oceana Sawyer is here she she was leading one of the ancestry um workshops and I had this like moment of insight, moment of insight in one of these meditations. Um, and uh, and it was like the the ancestors, even because because it's like, how do I heal the fact that I don't know them and I never will. I never will. I will never ever like other side of the world never know them. And so again, more grief, right? But also like how do how do I how do I bridge that just like within myself? Um, how do I not feel so like isolated on so many levels and and like I had this meditation it's like boom like this image this vision this whatever you want to call it is it great and it was like the ancestors are the roots right obviously and I am a leaf and if you look at a tree will will the leaf ever see the roots no it's a leaf it's outside it sees the sun it sees the wind it sees the birds you know whatever and but what is feeding it is the roots, right? It is unseen. The unseen is oh, always so there and it's always sustaining. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? There's so many good metaphors in this event. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's beautiful. And so that that's kind of how I've come to a sense of healing about ancestry and how do I hold my ancestors? Well, actually my ancestors hold me, right? That's my answer. And, and, and just the like, but by like, and even though I will never know them, it's, it's, it's this intrinsic of like, just as the roots feed the leaf, my ancestors feed me, even though the leaf will never see the roots. Does that make sense? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love that so much. And I think as someone who doesn't, I always thought I didn't look like either side of my family. 
I still don't really think that I look like my parents, but finally my dad or my mom for like, after the 10th time I told her, like, I don't look like, you know, either of you, am I adopted? I know I'm not, but am I <laughs> like, um, she was like, um, we actually think that you look a lot like your dad's sister. Um, my, yeah, like my, um, my auntie, um, who passed away a couple, a couple years ago. And it's just like, oh my gosh, I, I not only can I see it, but like, I just see so much of her, like within myself. And I, I just think that's so powerful that your ants, like our ancestors do like hold us up and that they're imbued so much more in us than like we'll ever even know. Um, but actually like, we don't need to do anything, you know, like, I mean, of course, like, I think like we can honor them and like how we live our lives. Um, but at the same time, we don't need to like, I guess, like unlock something like deep inside of us or, you know, like feel like um, access something like it's already just in like us being alive and <laughs> in existing, like we're already doing that. So um, yeah, I just find that really encouraging Crystal. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Oh my gosh, like with five minutes left of this event, this, there's never enough time so many for questions. <laughs> and it's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, with that, before I turn it back to Andy, which I'm sure he's going to cover, um, we just want people to know that we do have a tea chat event um, next week, same time. And for this ex exact um, opportunity for the conversation to continue. So we invite everyone who's on here who wants to continue this conversation um, to join us next week. Um, and it will be more an opportunity for us to hear from the audience, um, you know, to see, you know, to hear and give you a week to process things that have come up for you or questions. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Andy. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, Holly. Um, wow. Uh, this was just amazing to have such brilliant minds in one space. Um, uh, I want to share with you at some point soon this poll that we have, which I will do. Um, let me pull it up. And what's, what's going to be interesting for me is sort of remarking what uh, Aisha said about the problematics of some of these terms like biracial, you'll see that term come up in this poll. So I want you to um, email me at andy at let's reimagine.org um, and tell me what you thought of these questions because Table Talk is still a work in progress and uh, I'm happy to um, uh, take your feedback on this. So I'm just gonna let this run and then I want to share my slides. Hold on one second. Um, let's see. Here we go. Yes. Um, also, I just wanted to also just uh, give you feedback on some of these amazing nuggets uh, of knowledge that came from this. Um, Jessica, quote, although race is a social construct, it has a biological impact on people. That was quite powerful. Um, also, I appreciated Crystal, you know, this notion of the precariousness, the precariousness of belonging. Um, uh, so we have these other table talks coming up um, that I'm responsible for. Um, Pride Month, uh, we have our LGBTQ plus focused sub-series of, of, of Table Talk, uh, May 25th, um, a conversation about uh, solo aging for LGBTQ plus elders and these amazing housing initiatives. We've got a program on spirituality, uh, grief, and the Puerto Rican experience on June 1st. And then on June 8th, uh, Ballroom has something to say, um, where we showcase the beautiful house ballroom community. Um, I just, this is uh, Holly and Elizabeth's last uh, talk for now um, with the AAPI series. Um, I just want to congratulate both of you for leading this effort. Um, you've done a wonderful job on this, so thank you. Um, what else do I have to say here? Um, yes. Well, um, I also just want to invite the speakers. Some of them have done this already, but if we have any events coming up or if you have any social media that you'd like to promote,
please put it in the chat so that the audience members can keep following you after this talk. I think that's it for now. Yeah. So thank you all. And we hope to see you at more Table Talks in the future. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. I know this wasn't nearly enough time as we needed to answer all the questions and to have the conversation that we really could have. But that's what next week's Tea Chat is for, if you can make it. So please join us. And yeah, sorry, there isn't a link ready for it yet. <laughs> we haven't put it up. Um, but we'll be, we'll be sending a follow-up email with a link to register. So thank you again to Aisha, Crystal, Jessica, and Sarah for being our guests today. And we're so glad to have you at the table. Take care, everyone, and have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>